Welcome back to the Think Fitness Life podcast, everybody. We are on month two here, coming up to the end of month two of season two. And we're talking about food as fuel. Food as fuel. And before we dive right in, we always open up with some news. I do not have anything today, but I believe Eric does. Yes, I was uh, actually released uh, probably a couple hours ago now, and it was it was going over, you know, everyone's uh, favorite diet keto, and where it said it it has good effects. It also mentioned on instead of this website, uh, Mind Body Green recently reported that the diet could cause hair loss by causing extreme stress or malnourishment. So I was like, oh, interesting. I got to read this article. Um, so they had some MDs and doctors kind of look into, you know, what kind of goes into this, what's causing the hair loss. And, you know, a lot of people were going about it the wrong way, you know, kind of jumping right into keto and not really understanding how it fully works and how like your system will thrive off of it and can feed fuel, fuel off of it. So a lot of these people are just dropping you know, a huge amount of calories and nutrients out of their diet and then just going on this high fat and like drinking olive oils and eating like the bulletproof co- proof coffee. And when you take all that stuff out, you know, you, you're, you're putting a lot of stress on the body to figure out how to operate. And if your body, not everyone's ready at the same time to accept it and, and go into ketosis and the keto diet, they were saying a lot of people were, you know, finding some hair loss issues. Yeah, you know, I'm really not surprised because I always say extremism in either side is is usually wrong. It's always somewhere kind of in the middle. And, you know, the bottom line, which we'll get to later, is just that your body wants vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And it can do that in many different pathways. And if you shut it down, if you shut down a certain pathway, there's going to be um, detrimental effects. And then we've done that for so long that we think that that was evil. And now that we won't, now that that process was shut down, we want to just focus on that process and shut down the others. And we don't realize our mistake there because we already went that route of being extreme and it having, uh, secondary effects, right? Shortcuts created shortcomings. How do we not learn from our previous fuck up. Not to say it's, just, it's so annoying. Not to say but, keto um, is bad. Hey, you know that's. Oh, I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't think want the, people I, to think keto is bad ahead, out there, but you have to run and realize, like you said, extremes. You know, you have to you have to follow the process, and, and you can't go. You have to when you're doing something drastic like that. You have to actually be, listen to your body and really pay attention to what you're getting in for nutrients, and not just you know cut a bunch of stuff out and be like, oh, I'm I'm there. So. You know, people listening, I mean, keto is not bad. We've gone over it in the past episodes that we we know you can't sustain it forever. It's not a longevity diet. It's it's kind of a, almost an intermittent diet kind of scheme that when worked in with overall eating and healthy living, it can have a good effect on the body. Yeah, because the idea is that you're getting keto into ketosis. So people have to go on this keto diet. People have to go on this extreme diet that is solely focused on getting a ketosis state that it takes a while in that extreme state for it to turn on. Um, and my point is that you have to be that extreme to get this little process on that should already be going on in the background. And to put it in perspective, athletes are probably slipping in in and out of ketosis, in and out throughout their performance, in and out throughout their, their, their practices. Their bodies are just more diverse in its energy profile, and they haven't gone through long periods of lack of exercise and lack of a diverse diet. So if they went through a period of even if they took a year off, they got injured and they just sat sat around and ate the same cycle of garbage for a year. I guarantee their their body would 
not be performing as well when it came to um, different energy substrates and partitioning partitioning food as fuel. So, yeah, I think I think people just go yeah, like you said, they just go go too extreme. And it's not you can't think of it as like a lifestyle. It's like it's like a tool. It's something that your body already does. It just might not innately be able to do it right now, and you just gotta get it back online. But that kind of leads us into what we're going to talk about today, which, um, yeah, that's, it's a great place to start. I think um, one thing to mention is the basis, the end game for all this fuel, right, or food is um, fueling our mitochondria and getting our mitochondria to um, create ATP and ATP is literally stored energy. It's literally trapped in the bonds. And then when it's used, it becomes a DP and then, and it becomes a MP. So everything's converted and eventually gets back to ATP and our mitochondria are the powerhouse, um, warehouse, so to speak within each cell that's producing this energy and creating this ATP and the, the body can converts this in three main mechanisms that require a glucose molecule and, you know, sugars and carbohydrates are close to this molecule, but they're not as clean as, as fats and proteins. So a good analogy is if you think about um, going to the gas station and putting gas in your car, you know, you could use 83 gasoline in your car or you could use the premium, like the 97 in your car. And the quality of fuel is going to leave a different level of byproduct building up in the motor. And after too much firing in the motor, you're going to build up all this soot and this waste on the sides and interior of the motor in the same scenario um, with the 97, you're not going to build up that soot. You're not going to build up all the damage in the interior of the motor and the car is going to be able to perform better throughout that time. So, you know, basically two cars, one with 83 fuel, one with 97 fuel, they go the same distance. The 97 is going to perform more, more efficiently, putting more power to the road, and it's going to have less buildup in the motor, whereas the 83 motor is going to build up gook and grime and soot in the motor, and it's not going to perform as efficiently. As efficiently. Um, now, I think a key distinction to make right now is um, – performance and longevity and Menchie's going to go into it more about the athletic side of performance and talk more to athletes. And I'm going to say and talk more to like general pop and, and kind of how I live my life too. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where the idea started to be able to test the limits of performance, but the idea of bigger, stronger, faster leaves really little mental energy to worry about longevity and what that motor does after it's done racing down the track or you know what 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 a greyhound or a horse does after it can't compete at its at its finest. Um, so, if you think about the motor or the body wanting to perform at its best and compete with the best, um, we're gonna want to just pour racing fuel down your throat, right? We're gonna want to just carb load. We're gonna want to eat a lot of fruit. We're gonna eat rice. We're gonna eat potatoes, Gatorade, pastas, and we're get, gonna get you firing all cylinders at your fastest rate. And performance will be maxed out, but in the process, you're putting so much strain on that motor or, or body. And even if it's just for a quarter mile, that you know you might not realize, but you're damaging the integrity of that motor or the or your body. Um, so when we look at fu- food as fuel for performance, we should be careful and understand that. Mench is going to talk more about like the record book setting athletic performance. And, um, you know, so what we want to be careful about is are we trying to perform and compete with the best? Are we trying to push our limits? Are we trying to leave our imprint in the record books? Then go right ahead, turn off me and fast forward to the rest of this podcast of Menchie's part. But if you're concerned with the respects to longevity, um, then you'll respect that the average life expectancy of an elite athlete is actually less than someone from the general population. So if you're still listening, then you clearly clear about maximizing your performance with respects to longevity. And... The best way to do that is making glucose in different forms and in the carbohydrate, fruit, 
sugar, pastas, um, breads and all that form. It's a, it's a faster way for your body to get glucose. But again, it leaves soot and build up inside the, the motor inside your body that, that leaves long-term damage. So to create glucose in different pathways, uh, a major one that gets shut off is the process from fat. And, um, you know, another one's amino acids, which we'll get into that later. But the one from fat is a series of processes, uh, processes and it requires efficiency and repetition and, and timing. And if you've relied on glucose for from carbs too much, then your body's become lazy and less efficient at these processes. Um, let alone it might not even know how to really take a fat cell and turn it into energy. Um, but it really is about understanding that these processes in the body are actually driven by the mitochondria, which live inside bacteria. And these processes require vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and where are they heavily uh, found? In our soil, on the earth. And then they end up in turn show up in um, vegetables, oils, proteins, um, you know, animal source protein, obviously, as well, especially things that graze on plants and and stuff from the earth, uh, resistant starches, such as rices or pastas. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is efficiency. And I'm going to let Menchie talk a little bit more about performance and what, we can kind of ping pong back and forth. But so to perform at your best without sacrificing any sort of long-term integrity, we want efficiency. We want the body to be able to be able to pull glucose from multiple storages. We want the body to... Um, be able to basically produce as much ATP without burning as much energy and without consuming as much energy. So if you think about, I thought about this today. And I think if you think about how we already do that, if you if you look back to like how you know the the Roman era and the Greek era and all and the statues, right? We kind of naturally looked that way in the lifestyle that we ran. Um, we were probably outside eight to 12 hours a day just being physically active and we weren't as indulgent with ice creams and cookies and such like that. But in order for us to get to that physicality now today in today's life um, without, you know, we're still being efficient without being outside 10 to 12 hours a day, we only have to work out for, for like 60 to 90 minutes a day. So in all, in a way we're already trying to be this efficient. So think of, Food for fuel, if you're a general population person, is you're trying to maximize your body's output for least a lot of uh, least amount of input. So, if you can get a two day workload done in one day and you can still make strides towards improving your lifespan, that's a win win in my book. And that's what it comes down to. I mean, you you want to have it at the end of the day be that win win, and I think. And I hate – I'm not going to say hate, but I, I dislike and like that you use the athletic side because you know that's what it is. And I'll explain briefly what it is. But I want to kind of like – help people understand that you can do almost both and still have a healthy lifestyle. But if you really want to you know, exceed at some things in the performance standpoint, whether it's you want to put muscle mass on, body build, sprint, be good athletes – you're going to have to go to some of these far end of, okay, how do I apply myself? But if you go too far, you can actually still impede performance on the athletic side of it, um, huh. which is, okay. which is huge. So, you know, your typical athlete, you know, when you're, you're, you're told growing up, you know, all right, we're going to carbo load, like you said, pastas, basically eat everything under the sun with carbohydrates to fuel your system. Perfect. That's what we want. You know, you're going to go run a 200 meter sprint. You're going to be using carbohydrates. The problem I usually see is with intake of certain things. So people think, yeah, I'm working out hard. I'm lifting, I'm sprinting, I'm running. And they don't really have a, a care for what they're putting into their system. So they're saying, hey, I'm just going to eat whatever for fuel. And I kind of like and don't like that whole, you know, food is fuel because it is and it isn't at the same time. When you kind of talk about fat, carbs, and protein, yeah, your body's going to use it as fuel, but there's so many other nutrients out there 
that are not fuel that your body needs to run efficiently. And on the athlete side, a lot of people don't get that or they're, they're lacking in some of these areas where they should be more efficient. So your traditional, I mean, we want to call it athletic meal. You know, you wake up, you have protein, uh, some sort of carbohydrate and fat. And that's basically your every single meal is, is replenishing that over and over again. And I, you know, as an athlete, you know, we, I'm sure you used to eat a lot of breads and sandwiches back in the day. Oh yeah. Um, anything to kind of put on size or mass or whatever your coach kind of wanted you to do. They tell you to do, you know, deli meat sandwiches and all that stuff. Break it down. I mean, you could be breaking down glucose in a 200 meter sprint and you lose. And you look at the person who wins and you say, why, why are they winning? Why are they how are they better? What are they doing differently? You could train in the exact same way, but if that person that wins is have having a better balanced, nutritious diet, then it's a no brainer because their metabolism is running. They're they're churning over energy at a different rate because they're getting all these nutrients and vitamins that help aerobic metabolism. Helps carbohydrates convert to pyruvate more often. Helps more acetyl CoA. That's the stuff you want to get into. So when I tell people now or people ask me, oh, should I be drinking Gatorade? I'm like, that's the last thing you really want to be drinking Um, because that's just pure sugar, A, and yet it'll help you. But that kind of sugar is not efficient in the body. I'd rather have you say, hey, all right, we're going to carb load, but I want you to eat some some rice, some sweet potatoes, some protein, um, and some veggies the night before because you got to complement everything. Your, your body will run efficiently. And I think the bridging the gap, I mean, athletes are athletes, but athletes are not going to understand. You still have to eat healthy. Yeah. You still have to eat your greens, eat your fruits, eat your vegetables. It's got to be there because, you know, and especially in the US, I mean, the amount of people not meeting the RDA for something like vitamin A or calcium or folate or vitamin E. I mean, we're talking 68% to 86% of the population. That's a huge amount of people. Um, so I think, you know, athletes, you get, you got to kind of go back to and, and look at it. Okay. Yes, yeah, I want to be good, but I also want to have longevity. Do I want to be more efficient and have that longevity while I'm in my sport or while I'm participating? And people out there in the general pop, you can't look at these athletes and what they eat because they're on a different level than us. Completely different level. I think it was was it years ago when Michael Phelps was was training. He was eating like ten thousand calories a day because he was working out you know, four to five hours a day, I think, or, or maybe even more. So people look at that and they're like, "Oh, I, I can mimic that," or they can do this, they can do that. You got to be very careful. I know there's a lot of athletes out there that push their their diet schemes, which works for them. But and and another one yeah. is, is the Tom Brady diet. It works for him, but if you're a sprinter that needs to run an 800 meter sprint, that sort of diet and regimen, it might work, but for the majority, it's not going to work. Um, so it's, it, it's very, if you're an athlete, you have to look at your demands. You have to look at what you're going to be doing, what your energy needs are going to be. I mean, cause running a marathon and running a hundred meter sprint are two different energy systems that need different demands. Yeah, that's, um, you, you make a really good distinction, and I think we need to talk about it. Um, the elite athlete versus <sighs> the rest of the world. I know, right? <laughs> like, it's what it comes well, down to. Like, there's general population, people who are just trying to maintain their health and their life status and, and perform better, think better, feel better, move better. But then there are people who – I guess we'll call them like the – the the youth athlete right like someone who yeah. grew up playing sports all the time but didn't make it to pros or anything but just still incorporates athleticism into their lifestyle into their um whatever their daily routine their weekly routine i know i still play soccer that was my favorite sport when i was playing as a kid and i still am in the gym every single day so because i love working out um so you so there is definitely a key distinction I guess it would be like a, a non-professional athlete, professional athletes, non-professional athlete, and general population. And I mean, look, I want 
I want everyone to be like you and I, like an athlete who, you know, goes to the gym, goes and plays pickup softball, soccer, whatever. Like to me, that's go be an athlete, still be an athlete. I think I totally agree. I totally agree. Will be like, oh, I was a former athlete. It's like, well, why'd you stop? Or, or you, it's it's still in you. We just got to dig it out. But that's where I want, even like the general pop. I tell people like that's where I kind of want people to kind of fall. If we were we're looking at like a maybe this like spectrum of okay, elite athletes, untrained general pop, like your your average athletic person. I think I think I'd want everyone to fall into okay, you know, this person can go play a soccer game, feel fine. Um, and then so, you know, kind of go to the gym, work out every day and, and be knowledgeable about nutrition and what they're putting into their system. I totally agree. And the uh, first quote that came to mind was from um, someone that was on a Joe Rogan podcast. And he see, they said something about like being the warrior in the garden versus being the gardener in the war. And not like we're actually literally preparing for a war right now, but that's where the, the roots of that quote come from. And it's like, you should be able to, your body should be able to um, run and perform in, in the instance of like being able to squat comfortably or, you know, hold on to something heavy for an extended period of time. You should be able to run, you know, without getting winded. You should be able to be in a general physical shape for whatever may come your way rather than be completely out of shape um, and have to train or go through periods yeah. of getting back into shape. Who was it? And who the, um, the, with the blueprints? One of them was like get out and sprint or get out and play every day, have that ability. Oh, it was Mark Sisson Primal it's Blueprint. Like yeah. It's like you got to have it. Yeah, you, I mean, you you should. We, everyone should, but it's it's not realistic for everybody's lifestyle to still right. be able to play or, or get, even get time t- towards their own health, um, let alone recreation. But I, t- I totally agree. I think everybody should be in like the non non professional athlete category if they can. Um, but it's just hard for people to prioritize th- themselves like that. And some people just didn't grow up like that. Some people didn't grow up with that that physicality um, routinely kind of ingrained in them. But I think, I think what we're, all, what we're both kind of circling back to, which is why I kind of stopped. Cause I figured you would get into yours is, um, how the most efficient fuel source ends up being fats for fuel. And there's a couple key distinctions to make here that there's nine calories per gram of fat. Four calories per gram of protein, four calories per gram of um, a carb, a sugar, a sugar molecule. Yeah. I'd, I'd say so efficient if you can use it right, which is very key. But continue. Cor- correct. We'll correct. There. You're we'll right. There. Exactly. Your your body right now might not be efficient with it, and if you ate a bunch of olive oil right now, you might get really bloated because your body wouldn't know how to do do with it except for just store it. Um, but so then you got to also think about the amount of area that that would take up. So then you got to think of a cup of rice, a cup of chicken and a cup of oil, and they would all take up, um, right. Like a different amount of volume in your gut and they would all provide a different level of calories um, so one cup of rice provides you about 200 calories. That's your, your baseline energy right there, right? 200 calories to, to burn in the mitochondria and help c- produce ATP. In a cup of chicken, we have about 350 calories. And then in a cup of olive oil, we have close to 2,000 calories. So if you think about having to pack for a backpacking trip, what's going to take up less space in your body and ultimately what's going to take less energy to carry with you. So if I'm storing a thousand calories of energy on my body in the, in the, um, 
in the uh, what's the word I'm looking for in the form of oils, it's going to take up less energy for me to even carry that with me than it does all the chicken and all the rice I would have to hold on to my gut in in my gut um, to equal that same calorie. So that's one way our body is super efficient. And it's crazy because if you look at if you look at you know fat stores in the body, I'm not I'm not saying if it's your you know, you're overweight or not, but like traditionally, fat stores. If you're you know you're an average person, fifty thousand to sixty thousand calories of stored energy. That is a a crap ton of energy um, just to be stored in the body. So if you look at you know how we're kind of built and designed, I mean, yes, we hold on to carbohydrates as glycogen and, and glucose, but I mean, fats is how our system holds on to energy and survives. It's like a safety net, but we should also shouldn't have a huge safety net. And I think that's where a lot of people go because nowadays when you look at, you know, our traditional, you know, oh, food is fuel. We look at three things. We look at, okay, protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Most people think it's fat and they're like, oh, fat is bad because I'm going to gain weight. Most people are like, oh, protein, uh, I really don't like protein or I don't care. So what's left to eat? A lot of the majority of people eat more carbs than they should even be considering thinking about a day. Um, it, it's, it is, it's amazing how, how carb heavy the society has got. And I'm talking through not like carbs. I don't think we're talking good carbs. I think we're talking you know chips, breads, processed foods, all that stuff. Is carbohydrates with like fat thrown in. What do you mean? Like a lot of, so you said fat is the most efficient fuel for our system. Oh, you're saying, and then fat thrown in like on top of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like say a, a generic, um, like chocolate bar or something, you get all the sugar and then there's like these, trans fats that are thrown in to hold everything together and that just wreaks havoc on the system so people right. are getting fat in but it's like no mix with the sugar you're creating like a bad combination right yeah yeah, yeah. no and that's a that's a really good point because yeah like that that's where the everything in moderation saying doesn't make any sense because right. That's when moderation kills you. That's when having carbs and fats in your cell or in your system, the body says, "Well, this glucose is way easier." Or, yeah, this this is this glucose is way easier to get to glycogen than this fat. So we're just going to do it this way, and it gets so good at doing that that it gets lazy at it's using its fat processes, and it doesn't know how to use them when you go back to them. But yeah, it'll use the sugar molecule and then actually. Um, does it store the fat as pyruvate? No, triglycerides. Triglycerides. That's right. That's right. Because to to um to look at someone's history dietarily, a doctor really just needs your um, hemoglobin H one C H one A C and your triglycerides, and they can see kind of how your body has been partitioning for fuel and if it's been storing fats or using fats, and that's the only reason I and mean, this is going way too in-depth not to talk about this, but um, it's interesting that I was reading this just recently was um, LDL and HDL. Like the LDL number is only a problem in a certain time of year. Like we go through growth phases and regression phases and LDL is only a problem when triglycerides get above LDL because the LDL is like the transporter molecule. So if, if our triglycerides outwork our, or outgrow our LDL number, then we're fucked because now there's not enough Ubers for all these people waiting for rides. And now all these people just start squatting and setting up shop in our home in our, in our land and our body. Um, and it becomes a huge problem. I mean, the, the traditional Western diet is basically what's, what's killing us. And, and the whole point of, I think, you know, this f- food is fuel. Like you got to take this whole mentality and look at it and be like, no, this is food is longevity. Food is going to be feedback for my body. Food is. Yeah, what's but gonna- I think people. I think the mindset there is they're looking at food as 
this will be fuel. They're not looking at food as an emotional enjoyment or like a, a party. You know, some people do that. They're like, oh yeah, well maybe a little bit of both. I mean, you never know. Game? What was it? Maybe a little both. Like you think, oh, all right, we won't get we won't get crazy with the hormones stuff. But like, oh, I'm hungry. Mm, am I really gonna have? Oh, there's a clementine there, or there's this. Mm, there's this like ice scoop of ice cream there. I think a lot of it stems from it. We won't get, I don't want to go onto the emotional side or like the, the mindset side of it, but I think a lot of it drives that like, okay, prior, I'm going to eat this because I know it tastes good. Why would I have something that's nutrient dense and really good for my system, but it's not going to taste good. Yeah. 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 I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, so I guess, I guess one thing I want to bring up though is not only looking at, I guess, I guess we'll use the word nourishment, right? Look, look at how you're going to nourish your body. Um, but one thing I want to bring up from this book, The Longevity Paradox by Dr. Gundry, the one that I talked about um, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, um, is the evolution of, of organisms and single-celled organisms to multi-celled complex organisms um, you know, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, um, understanding how mitochondria evolved and how our bacteria evolved and essentially created how animals and, and um, cells started evolving into animals and people. And 90%, 90% of our cells are bacteria viruses, fungi, worms, and they make up your micro and your holobiome. Um, they want to continue to pass on their DNA. So they're kind of more in control of the home, the, the host, right? Than say you are. Um, and really you are just a walking host of bacteria. Um, so if you take care of them, they can take care of you. And if you're stuck in a negative cycle, it means that you basically have squatters of bad bacteria in or in your body, and they're hijacking um, the the vagus nerve is what it's called, but they're hijacking the the communication pathways, sending signals to your brain to get what they want, and what they want is something different than what your good gut bacteria wants, or with the good mitochondria in your system wants. So it's funny how, um, what I'm getting at here is, is it's funny how viewing this stuff from the, from the perspective of the way I had my diet when I was eating lots of pastas, bread, sugars, fruits. Um, it was funny how back then, like I saw no basis for this way of living and was totally against it and didn't think I was going to be able to perform, didn't think I'd ever even want to eat vegetables and how the tables have really turned. And now it's not that I am getting these cravings for pasta and getting these cravings for fruit and I'm cognitively shutting them down. It's I'm literally like, oh, I, I, I can't wait to like throw a sweet potato in the oven when I get home and Oh man, I have like some some raw beets left. I'll chop up, and I got some sauerkraut, and oh, I still got um, a little bit of lemon juice and some radicchio, and oh, I'm gonna steam some some Brussels sprouts, and it's like those signals are being sent to my brain from the good bacteria that lives within me, and I know it sounds crazy, but unfortunately, ninety nine percent of all genes that make up you or me are bacterial, viral, protozoal, and they're not human at all. So it really isn't far-fetched to say that we are just hosts for other living organisms and bacteria. Yeah, we don't we don't really run our especially when it, when you want to talk about the GI system, we do not run that sector at <laughs> oh, all. Oh, so when you're eating Think about that. Like, like it might be a cognitive effort to get yourself out of, you know, the addictive to garbage cycle. Right. But yeah, like you're trying to get water for yourselves. I mean, how many people have had the issue of needing to cognitively say, I need to drink more water today. And you know, your cells want it. And you know that 
you need it for your parts of your body. It's not that you're like dying of thirst and you're like, I need to drink water this second. It's like, you know that, you know what? I should probably drink more water today for the stuff that's going on in your body. Same thing with the, when you put something in your mouth and eat it. Um, so yeah, I think, but you- I think we hit the nail on the head when you talk about all these different processes in the body, the way they operate, the way they produce energy, use energy, all those little systems require vitamins, minerals, and, and nutrients. And and like you said, if, if you know everything we put in sends a signal, sends a message. You know everything flows together. So if you, and I think this is where a lot of people are like, oh, if I eat this, you know, it just affects my gut and it doesn't affect anything else. But now people are starting to see, okay, oh, if I eat, you know, this gluten, I'm getting a skin rash. It's like, yeah, well, your body's trying to tell you something. It's going to put you know, aggravation or stress or, or an immune right, function you disorder that. anywhere else. But, you know, you got to have balance and flow throughout your systems. And when we're talking, you know, we're telling the guts going up to the brain and it's going to the, the HPA axis and in the thyroid axis, it has a huge impact because once, once it goes to the brain and it starts talking to the brain, it's either like, Hey, you're going to upregulate this or you're going to downregulate this. And when we start putting in, you know, malnutritious food into our system, you know, our thyroid is going to be like, hey, well, I can't really use this. Or if you want to send stress and drive all these processes up, like blood sugar, insulin, all this stuff, I can't do my job. I am going to turn down and deregulate your metabolism because stuff like the thyroid is one of the biggest controllers of your metabolism and your whole body. That's crazy. And if that thing starts going awry. It's like an adaptation. um, Yeah. Yeah, because the thyroid basically it can its hormones it's agree can target all mostly all cells in the body. Huge player in metabolism. If you if that thing is off or you're cutting a lot of carbohydrates or you're eating crappy carbohydrates, good luck having hormone function or any any kind of metabolism that's going to be efficient. So if it starts down regulating, not efficient, it's a whole line coming down. Okay. You know, protein metabolism is not good. Carbohydrate metabolism is not good. Fat metabolism is not good. If that's not efficient, then what can happen? Okay, well, now we can be creating free radicals in the body and creating damage. DNA, that's another side. And but say, this whole hey, time, you've fired on your immune system. So you got the cops running around your body, sending alarms and signals to try to find these intruders and f- find what's negatively impacting yeah. the body. I mean, it's just such a – it's once – once I know this is what I want people to know is just because you have a candy bar doesn't mean you're you're like off the hook. Like it is a cyclical event that can affect every process of the body. And if you continue to do it over and over again, day in and day out, you know, there's no wonder why we have so many health issues and so many problems s- stemming up now. Because the body and- never got back to baseline. Because exactly when you put that initial candy or that foreign object in your body that your cells may have not, maybe not all of your cells wanted them together. Maybe some of the bad ones wanted it. Some of the bad bacteria wanted it. And some of the good bacteria is going to thrive off of some of the byproducts, whatever you put in your body. There is still a disruption to the system. And, and what everything talking about, mentioned just talking about there is basically like think of a bunch of roads of pathways and there's a bunch of lights and all these intersections and they're all set on timers so that everybody drives through freely and gets through on time without stopping or with any traffic buildup. And essentially what happened was there was a big asteroid that hit this roadway and now everything's fucked up. Lighting's timing's fucked up. There's traffic building up everywhere, uh, roadblocks, what have you. So in order for um, that to be fixed, the, the body needs time to repair the roads, you know, take on whatever inflammation had occurred and repair the tissue um, before it can handle another asteroid, so to speak, right? Or another candy bar. But you're totally right. It's the problem of how we overdo it, how we might have, um, we might have fruit three months out of the year. And now look at us. We got fruit every day of the year. So we're in a 365 growth cycle. Or we, we might have a, a – I don't even think people are eating that much fruit. What was it? 
I don't even think people are eating that much like healthy fruit for themselves. I mean, <laughs> like at least you'd have, yeah, the, I, you'd have the I'm, I'm fruit. Right. Yeah, like I was giving them a, a better case. In- no, 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 I know what you're saying. Like, you know, we're so used to having, Yeah, I can go to the supermarket and get any kind of food I want in January and I can go the same and get the same amount of food in, you know, August. Like it's completely different, but it's, it's for enough to knock on having fruit. But like, I, th- I don't even think people – are getting like the recommend recommended fruit intake a day. No, but let alone the like point vegetables. Is, is that I was, what I was highlighting of yours is that you're getting a too constant of a disruption without yeah. a level of healing and regression and rest. Um, and it's like you said, you're, you're you're basically redlining a system. You're redlining an an engine, and once the engine is at redline too long, boom, issues. Then you go on medications and that's a whole nother bout, but no, it's not that's true. not like and we are. And you know, that doesn't fix about, anything. Um, this whole episode is about food for fuel. And one of the best ways to get your body to be that um, fuel efficient hybrid car is actually low calorie tricks. Um, the most famous, one of the most famous nutritionists from the 1400s fit to 1500s lived to be like 102. His name was like Luigi Carnello. And um, I'll get more information on this guy, but he started the initial thoughts of longevity. And then the uh, current Dr. Walter Luongo did research on lower calorie intake for a short period of time, like two to three days. You do like 700 calories and it lowers people's basal metabolic rate or it lowers people's um, operating core temperature. So, and, and redlining was the first thing that you said that made me think of it because we're operating at 98.6. In reality, our bodies could actually operate at 96. And most people who live to be the longest, the blue zones, live into 100 or more at functional abilities like standing up, picking up things, moving things, running things, still being like athletic at 100, not just being athletic to be or being uh, able to get to 100 in like a, you know, whatever, electro equipment plugged into a wall. Um, they operate at, at 96 degrees. It's because they've gotten their body to not redline. It's saying, oh, I don't need to be at 6,000, 7,000 RPMs to go 20, 30 miles an hour. I can be at 4,000 RPMs, at 5,000 RPMs, and still maintain 20 to 30 miles an hour. And that's what you're getting your body to do is, a, is essentially back to efficiency, getting your body to perform its same job with less energy expenditure and with less energy inputted into the system. So, yeah. um, and, and that's what's key. And I know, I know, I know, obviously, we've worked together over the years and I mean, I've seen your diet change immensely through like, you know, all this knowledge. And I'm, I mean, I, I, you know, we should kind of recommend what, what, how we kind of approach it and what we've used over the years to, to go from this, this mindset of, of one way thinking and, you know, recommendations and whatever the USDA food wants to think we want to eat. How's it, how's yours trans transformed to what it is now? That's a great question. It's a great way to end um, this episode. I'm really happy you brought that up Um, because I started writing it in my notes and I was like, no one wants to hear this shit. But um, yeah, my my goals were actually like very, very vain in the beginning. Uh, I lacked confidence very in my head, social anxiety to the extreme. And all I want to do is just get bigger, look better. Uh, you know, at the time I was like 120 pounds soaking wet at 5'8", uh, just like a scrawny string bean. And I figured, you know, if I could get be- be- bigger and I could look better, maybe I could get a girl to even look at me, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I used to carb load, pastas, breads, huge amounts of protein, you know, so as much chicken as you could stuff your face with, um, fruits, uh, and then, you know, obviously the candies, cookies, and all that stuff, um, eggs and oatmeal for breakfast. I, I'd have chicken and rice for post-workout. I'd have tuna and whole wheat bagels kind of the rest of the day, every, every three hours until dinner. And dinner was like swiping at the dining hall or, or going to get some chicken and rice again. 
Um, and then weekends, man, I would think that I was recovering. I would, I would view the fact that I was, I had beaten up my body and I had burned all this energy and destroyed all this tissue that my body needed fuel. And in order to do that, I would eat like a package of double stuffed Oreos. I'd eat like a full <laughs> bag of chips. I'd eat, you know, a big con- th- container of milk to go with the Oreos. I'd get some gummy candies because basically I just needed something sweet. I needed something salty and I needed something chocolatey. And dude, I was I was still like 6% body fat. I looked great. I felt great. I had good confidence. But eventually I did understand that my, my short-term goals were not aligning with my long-term goals. And, you know, we'll, we'll keep um, the story short, but... Um, it probably wasn't until I was shitting blood for a month that I (laughs) said, I should probably go see somebody about this. And, um, sure enough, I had lost like 20 pounds and my body had built up all these ulcers inside of its colon and all these lesions from inflammation and couldn't, couldn't repair itself. And just things were in haywire. It was literally like, um, doomsday asteroids have been hitting left and right all over the city. And the city planners and construction teams were like, fuck this shit. Let's just tear all this shit down and re- and maybe we'll rebuild when it's all done. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't know what to do. And I knew that food and the relationship my body had with food was, was different. And I had to learn about it and learn about my bacteria and my gut and how to rebuild it and how to rebuild my gut wall and all this stuff. And the first place I started – was a fad diet and I read about it, researched it, and then I wanted to try it uh, because it had a good basis for science and it was the Whole30, the Whole30 diet. And um, actually Jerry, I think, recommended it to me. And that was the first, it was an an elimination diet. So it was eliminating a bunch of shit and I had to be really strict for 30 days. And... um, then I would slowly reintroduce things and and get a better understanding of how my body responded to things. So to answer your question in short is just becoming cognitively online and aware of this stuff is how I eventually did it, how I eventually ended up and and reading things and being aware of things and and educating myself again, like cognition, awareness. Um, It wasn't rocket science, but it was about learning You know what? The hardest part was about learning what is reliable source and what is unreliable. And in this day and age, there's too much educated, unreliable sources that are trying to steer you one way or the other just to get you to pull out your wallet. And I think it's really important to be skeptical of scenarios like that and be be understand that it doesn't take your wallet to get where you're going. And if someone's jumping that gun pretty quickly, it's probably because they're trying to ride the fact that it's called impulse sales. They're, they're trying to ride that dopamine high and get you to that decision-making stage as quick as possible. Once you've seen the value, because they're hoping that you make that decision and then later regret it rather than think about it and then realize that you don't need to make that financial decision. So, um, awareness, information, and reliable sources. That's, I think th- that last one is actually the hardest one, but yeah, uh, and, and that, that's key. Um, how's, how's your changed? I mean, si- similar, I mean, you know, you know, back in, back in the day, trying to eat everything and just get calories in. Cause all I cared was about was, was protein and calories and all that jazz. Um, and at a young age, I kind of became like aware of, you know, like trans fats and, and cholesterol and, and kind of try to avoid a lot of that stuff. And then mm. kind of, you know, like you said, as you start reading more books and getting into certain programs, it's like, okay, you know, and I've read some nutrition, nutrition, sport nutrition books. That's like, oh, you know, pastas, this and that. I mean, these are now a little bit outdated books. I mean, we're talking early 2000s. You kind of go back and you're like, yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense in what they're saying, like the vitamins and stuff. But you know, now, now what we know today, it's like, no, all that stuff is processed. So it's, it's, 
it's basically now keeping up with, you know, the, the latest and grace of what's coming out in, in books. And I'd say like, I'm going to pick up the longevity book, but um, Mark Hyman's like, what the health? I mean, that was a huge book in my, my library to have as like a resource. And that's kind of shaped and I've tried a lot of different things and um, different ways, but now it's you know, the biggest thing is, is nutrients. You know, I don't really care about calories. I mean, I do and I don't, but it, it's how can I get the most nutrient out of, out of a meal, out of a, a snack and, and what am I looking for in that stuff? And I think that's where I kind of am now is how can I maximize my system overall efficiency with certain nutrients and what nutrients might I be missing that I need to add? Like I sometimes might need to add more, you know, orange and yellow foods rather than have all green foods. It, it, you have to have a balance. Yeah. No, it's, um, and it's forever changing. I mean, it, you can do, I was gonna say, it's forever adapting. Which is great. And, I think it's the best part. Yeah. You one day I can have, you know, uh, steak and potatoes and vegetables. Another day I can have all vegetables, some fruits and maybe some eggs and be fine. It's not like I don't, and I'm pretty re- regimen, you know, this, <laughs> like I can do the same thing every day, but knowing that I can yeah. go and be like, nah, I can just have all f- f- vegetables one day and fruits and still feel full because I can eat a good amount of quality and I'm not intaking thousands of calories. I mean, you can have a big plate of vegetables and salads. You might not even top 600 calories at the end of the day. See, that's so funny because I've been using my fitness power for the last like probably a little over 30 days and I want to go like a full 90 so I can have like some data for people to look at. And in the beginning, I was just getting all my calories from um, olive oil. Like a gross amount of calories from olive oil. Like 20 tablespoons of olive oil is 2,500 calories. So I would measure this out and essentially it was like this little rice bowl that I had and I just fill that every time and I would pour that and I I got so gross that there was a weekend I had a 7,000 calorie Saturday and most of those calories, it was like, it was like 1800 calories in, um, coconut oil. It was, um, let me pull it up here. 900 calories in avocado. How many avocados? Thousand calories. Did you eat, like three? That was four. Ca- that was four avocados. That was that was dinner, and then lunch was twelve tablespoons of olive oil, twelve hundred calories, a whole avocado, um, and it was crazy. Like. I, I was, it was, I was, I was shocked at how many calories I was able to get in when I didn't worry about how much I was going to eat. I was just going to eat. And how'd you feel? So I was shocked I got so much in. Oh, dude, I felt like a fucking rock star. Yeah. But then I realized uh, back to the efficiency thing that I, I want to be able to operate and perform on a, on not high calories, right? Like we talk about redlining being at 98.6. That's a high heat. And when we're burning in our in when, when our core is burning at that high heat, there's actually different bonds that lead to AGE buildup, advanced glycation end product buildup, and those literally age us. That's why they got that acronym AGE. So we want to get our heat down to that 96 degree and not redline. So I was like, you know what, I should be fine eating, you know, 700 calories. So like for example today. Um, this week I'm, uh, is when I'm really testing it during performance because I was also worried about performing during the week and I would eat a lot more on the weekends. I'd go through 2,000, 3,000 calories a week, but I would do like a 24 hour fast. And now today I just had 700 calories in four tablespoons of olive oil um, and, a, and a sweet potato and then some Brussels sprouts and, and broccoli. But most of my, um, most of my food that I eat, nourishment, back to that word, you're 100% right. It's it's vegetables, it's beets, it's, it's sweet potatoes, it's white rice, it's chicken, it's eggs sometimes. Um, but the calorie side of things, where I'm getting most of my calories from, is olive oil, coconut oil, and, and avocado. Because the rest of the nourishment 
doesn't really provide that many calories. I, and that's where a lot of people need to get. They need to get from these high caloric and energy dense foods to nutrient dense foods with some healthy, good, optimal choice, higher caloric, whether it's oils or certain foods that will complement the lower nutrient dense food. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think that's what I tell a lot of people realize that olive oil can be as energy producing as it can be. I don't think people realize that because think about every time you hear somebody who is like a little faint, uh, a little lack of energy, or they might put their head on their hand and you see it, right? They'll, they'll always say, man, I think I need to grab a banana or I need to grab an apple or I'm kind of tired, uh, whatever, I'm low energy. I need to go eat some fruit. Like you're, you're just adding to the vicious cycle. You're just forcing that one pathway to strengthen because you're listening to your body to supply it with only sugar. And guess what? Actually, that's actually a pre-diabetic condition is being able to notice when you're low blood sugar. That's technically one of the symptom symptoms of being pre-diabetic. So go, go um, eat an avocado. That. You'll have the same exact effect. effect. Exactly. You'll feel full, you'll feel fine, be, boom. Yeah. yeah, 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 100%. Um, but it's, that's funny that, um, that we both have really, really changed our diets. Um, Every evolving, you know, you, you just learn more. Evolving is a great way to, to describe it. I think get away from the it, traditional, I think, uh, oh, put mass on whatever body build, whatever, <laughs> you know, that whole, that whole, and I still see people do it in the job today is. And if they want to do it, that's fine. But I mean, I, I think, you know, I know I talked about the athletic side um, in the beginning, but, you know, it's for me, it's kind of, it's more flipped to longevity and how I feel and how my body's going to be in, you know, 10, 20 years. I don't, I don't need any issues. I don't want to break it down. Right. And it usually always stems back to something that we put in our body, you know, like, uh, you know, we've been thinking about people who, have poor workouts and they'll say, you know, you're asking them questions and sometimes it'll come out that they didn't sleep that well. And you know, so sometimes they will, the people can literally identify and say, um, I ate something really bad last night or I ate something really bad yesterday or um, I ate something that didn't sit right with me and they can start to notice that. Um, totally but sometimes it's like, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I just, I just couldn't sleep last night. And I'm like, well, what you have for dinner? And they'll literally, you know, 50% of the time they'll tell me and they'll tell me what they had, not kind of understanding why I'm asking that. And 50% of the time they'll just tell me, oh, that doesn't matter. But uh, just a normal dinner, but I don't think anything affected it. And I'm like sitting there thinking like something went wrong in your body, the way it was functioning and it kept you up for whatever reason. And it just probably stemmed from your gut or something that you ate maybe yesterday or maybe even days before that that caused damage to your gut. So, you know, I, I, I can, I'll be repetitive as I need to be with this topic. And it's just crazy how much cells live in us and how much bacteria lives in us and how much we really are our future and our, our current state of, of um, our health is really more determined by the state of our bacteria rather than just us. <laughs> yeah. You, you feed it the right stuff. It'll, it'll take care of you. It's a, what do they call it? A symbiotic relationship. I think. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, you yeah. gotta take care of it. It'll take care of you. I mean, that's, that's, you win the game of games as you like to say. So I think, I think, um, my closing statement would be to, um, figure out what you need to nourish your body to perform at its finest. When it's not performing at its finest, don't write it off like it's a failed attempt. Write it off as you didn't get there yet, but there's some type of information in that. You ate something, you got a headache. You ate something, you got a stomachache. You ate something and you felt great 
all day long. You didn't feel like you, you had to crash or take a nap. Take note of all this stuff. And there's little feedback that signals that your body's giving you that you just need to be able to read and pick to piece together. And uh, you'll you'll get to where you need to be. Once you make that change, it's uh, your body will pick up on that. It'll become a new norm and and roll with it. I mean, that's that's what we're doing. We're 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 having each day having new resolutions and beginnings and and learning exp- experiences. And you know, with food, make the best of it. Treat your body how it should be. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>